So, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Ian Cutris. I am nominally a journalist analyst. Uh, I spend my days with semiconductor companies talking about the latest and greatest in the computing industry today from a very technical semiconductor standpoint and manufacturing. And in this talk, I kind of want to take you through a little journey about where we are in the land of the digital compute and transistors explain this very novel thing called Moore's Law, and is Moore's Law dead? I'm here to tell you it's not. We have roadmaps. And then go through the size and scales of how we build these things, how well we can build them, and uh, I think it's going to lead very nicely into the Intel chip that's talked later. We'll get into a bit of that. And then I kind of want to cover production, and then what we do with a modern supercomputer, and uh, the key parts in there, just to give a broad scope of actually how in-depth these things go and the fact that there are millions of people working on each individual element. So a little bit, a little bit about me. I spent 10 years as a semiconductor journalist covering the latest and in PCs, enterprise, and then eventually into the manufacturing process itself. But day by day, I'm an industry analyst. I help companies with strategy and especially with marketing and making sure that their technology is actually understandable between engineers, product managers, and my grandmother. Uh, so, so my background's all in computational chemistry, but uh, this video on the right is a video I did with IBM about their quantum computing strategy. That currently sits at half a million views because I'm something like an influencer, which is a weird word to say, but here we are. Uh, and then on the left is a TV show I'm doing with Sally Ward Foxton from EE Times called the AI Hardware Show, where we're covering uh, 70 of the AI hardware startups in the market, as well as a few of the big players. Uh, I'll cover that in the end, but it's a fun read. So let's start with where are chips? Well, chips are everywhere, but just exactly how prevalent are they? I've got a few lists up here, you know, things like your car has chips, your flash drive has chips, of course, so laptops have chips. But maybe your toaster has a chip. Your doorbell might have a chip if it has a radio in it. Anything with a rechargeable battery has a chip in it in order to mediate the charge, any sensor, any camera. And it's this bottom point here. The average smartphone has 169 chips. And I wanted to highlight that because people might think, well, there's just one or two, you know, the processing power and then the display. But no, there's actually a fair amount. And the bottom two points here I want to highlight is that these chips are not all the same. They're all doing different things. Well, they should be. Uh, but some of them require billions and billions of dollars of investment just to get off the ground, just to be able to manufacture them and get them working. And then three quarters of them are actually using legacy technology, just showcasing how important that the research we've already done is in the volume chip industry today. And I got these numbers from this slide. Uh, hopefully, when you get to see the slides later, you can have a look through this. Um, research done in 2021 uh, by this consulting agency based on 32 smartphones. 169 chips, but some of them are application processors, so CPU, modem, RF, power management, uh, yeah, image sensor, memory, all sorts of different technologies just going into the device in your pocket. So given the defense talk we just had, I don't know how many chips there are in an aircraft carrier. But let's start from, let's start from basics. Uh, what are these chips made out of? Well, switches, switches that we call transistors, and we actually just celebrated the 75th year anniversary of the transistor. Uh, from all the big vacuum tube down to, down to the end, but we haven't stopped here. We haven't stopped here because of a concept called Moore's Law. This is from uh, Gordon Moore's paper, one of the founders of Intel. There are different interpretations of what Moore's Law is, and people will argue to the death about them. Generally, the one I accept is the number of transistors doubles every couple of years in terms of density or cost. Uh, some, yeah, some people just say it's just density. Some people say it's more of an economic. Um, I, say, I say it's kind of both because of the way we're implementing the future technologies, which you'll go to. But this is showing you know, just how many components per integrated function on a log two scale. But a more mod modern version of this graph is by Intel. And Intel's plotted here the amount of transistors per, per package. So we're just talking about a simple, uh, essentially a whole functional compute element, which, as we'll see later, may be many chiplets. <coughs> but the whole point here is we're 
trending towards this. Uh, the CEO has aspired to one trillion transistors in a single chip by 2030, uh, using all the latest in uh, packaging and manufacturing technologies. And um, your modern smartphone is probably around 120 billion today. Thing is, that's actually the largest chip in the world right now. That's about that big. And uh, it's made by an AI company. Sorry, I am going to mention AI yeah. some more. Um, and this is by a company called Cerebrus. They're a startup out of Santa Clara, California. That is 2.6 trillion transistors. They've got some special IP in how to stitch them together. And this solves one of the problems in AI of uh, having networking communication. But it's a unique design for a unique product. Uh, they have customers, uh, some academic, some in pharma, uh, some in defense. And uh, the previous version of this cost two and a half million each. Um, and uh, yeah, Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center got a $5 million grant and was able to purchase two. Point being, in 75 years, we've gone from those massive tubes down to something with trillions and trillions of transistors. So let's actually talk about the size of a transistor. Now, I've said here human hair, 10 microns. Uh, online it actually says about 75 to 100, but if I did that, this scale wouldn't work. Um, and we go to 1990. So this is, this is all to scale. So transistor in 1990, we had 800 nanometer technology. So the ability to build a switch uh, to the pitch of about 800 nanometers. Go a decade forward, 130 nanometers. So again, to scale, already pretty small. And then, yes, it is there. Uh, you know, I think on this projector, it's literally two pixels. Uh, so that's 32 nanometer, and that's over 10 years ago. Today, I haven't even put it on because it won't fit. Um, but we call it a five nanometer, and I've put a big asterisk here because it's not five nanometers. Um, we have moved, from a technical perspective, transistors all used to be two-dimensional. We built them in a two-dimensional plane. We've since gone 3D and will be more dense. So they're kind of being funky with the names. It's still about 32 nanometers, but we have the effective performance of a, what would be a five nanometer chip. But in order to make it, you have to actually have a facility to build them. And uh, two of the biggest in the world is this one on the left, Intel, in Portland, Oregon. This is actually my photo. Uh, they actually took me a tour around the fab. We're talking about 200,000 square foot of clean room space down to, uh, I think they said, a particular every cubic meter, a half micron particular per cubic meter. So 10,000 10, times cleaner than an operating theater in order to build this stuff. Here's the equivalent one, TSMC in Taiwan. TSMC has about six of these as uh, one of the biggest in the world, if not the biggest. Problem is, they cost a lot to build, as you might imagine. It's, it's funny seeing numbers uh, in the press about how much investment is going to, into these things, but the companies at the leading edge are actually putting, betting the company every generation on the next generation technology. If it doesn't work, the company dies. As a result, we've seen the companies that are on the leading edge of this technology dwindle from about 20 to 3 today. Um, but this is Intel announced last year, $20 billion for two new fabs in Arizona. They're also investing in Germany, uh, Ohio, and they have a facility in Ireland, not in the UK. But the main reason why these facilities cost a lot is the tools you put in it. And this is a modern, this, this, this tool is still being built, but this is what um, we need in order to make these very dense uh, chips. Person on the left for scale, these things literally are stories high. I once visited a fab and realized why they couldn't fit a machine in because the ceiling was too low. Uh, but they cost $350 million each. There's only one company in the world that makes them called ASML, and they, they the version that they're currently making, they make about 40 a year, and, uh, but you have an 18-month waiting list. And uh, people are clamoring ha hand over fist. The companies that make this stuff, uh, either logic or memory, are clamoring ha hand over fist. In order for these machines to work, um, they uh, atomize droplets of tin and fire lasers at them to generate 13.5 nanometer wavelength light pass them through mirrors and masks, and then eventually you get something that plays cat videos on your phone. And here's one of those chips that plays cat videos. 
This is one of Apple's latest generation chips, Apple being at the forefront of consumer technology. Uh, this is something they've called the M1. You see here, 33.7 billion transistors. Uh, they've got an M2, which is even more dense than this. This was built at TSMC. And uh, I've got to put a UK company in here, kind of UK company, ARM. Uh, this uses ARM IP. So a mixture of ARM's uh, intelligence and Apple's brilliance builds this chip that is currently shipping in somewhere 10 to 20 million devices a year, maybe even more than that. Um, but why are we making these transistors even smaller? It's, uh, well, smaller transistors means more switches, means we can do more with these chips uh, in the same area, and density is a key factor. If we have more ability to do compute, we can get our work done faster. We can uh, see where the enemy is. So this, is all, this whole industry is a wealth of knowledge, of research, of development, of companies who are putting billions and billions and billions every year um, into this technology. And this is a graph here from Applied Materials, who actually manufactures. There is a competitor to ASML, but they make a lot of different tools. Uh, doesn't, sh doesn't show up well here, but what it's forecasting is that this market uh, is about, it just in terms of semiconductor industry revenue, so the people who make the chips, $1 trillion. If we go to the companies that actually sell the products that use the chips, you know, Apple's at $2 trillion, Microsoft's at $2 trillion, some software in there. But what's driving this trend in, in kind of like this last 10 years? After, we, after we've had 10 years of smartphones driving the industry, we've now got AI driving the industry. And, uh, but going back to that Moore's Law, will this scaling continue? Because even some of the biggest AI companies' CEOs say that Moore's Law is dead, the ability to shrink these transistors. Because eventually you're getting to the point where you're dealing in monolayers of atoms in order to create your switches. And there is a fundamental limit there. Right now, we're on this kind of far left side, 2020, 2022, where we're dealing with process nodes that are called three nanometer, but as I said before, that's if they were a planar transistor because we're doing fancy things with stacking. The reason why I've got this slide up is because this is, so this is IMEC. This is a Belgian research division uh, that works closely with ASML. There's also CA Letty in France and Fraunhofer in Germany. I think they're in Germany, but um, this roadmap goes out to 2036. And in order to do that, they have to get innovative with silicon, silicon germanium, uh, copper, ruthenium. You know, there's no element of the periodic table they don't explore, uh, to quote the CEO of Intel. And we get to a point here at about the 2034, 2036, where our transistors will literally be monolayers of, of stuff, not silicon, um, aluminum disulfide. Uh, here's a video I've done on my YouTube channel about that roadmap, about what it actually means to go down that far encourage you to check it out, if only for the views. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I found it really interesting because we rarely see roadmaps out that far in this industry. We see the research, and we see lots of research teams playing with all the different aspects of, of the material science and the prototyping. But to actually have one of these big research institutions say we actually have a roadmap out to 2036, of course, still some questions that we need answered and optimized. Um, but we have a fair understanding. Beyond 2036, well, then maybe we need some of the, uh, some of the other uh, computing paradigms that we're going to speak about today. Um, one thing I didn't hit on here is, is power. So one of the benefits of having smaller switches uh, to build these chips is that they actually run at lower voltage, and that saves power. But then you suddenly put 100x off them in a chip, and then you know, they kind of cancel out. And we're getting to a point now where, especially in data centers, the modern, uh, the chips that go into data centers, they used to be maximum about 120 watts 10 years ago, and now approaching 1,000. And our data centers are 10 to 100 times the size. And this means that the power consumption of data centers, which has been a hot topic in the press for many years, is, uh, is vast. It's getting to a point where it's bigger than, than certain smaller countries. But it now means that every country has to have an energy uh, infrastructure to be able to support 2 3 4% of that energy going into data centers, whether that's public, private, cloud. Um, and yeah, here's, here's a slide from the Ministry of Economy in Japan saying that you know, by 2030, it could be 15% of the world total power generation in, uh, in, in consumption. Some of this will be in the compute that I've talked about. Some of it will be in networking. Some of it will be in cooling. 
And uh, but if you cool it, and uh, then it, or if if it runs more efficient, then you actually save power on the cooling. But so how do we drive power efficiency in in in, in this traditional computing sense? There are two ways. First is the smaller transistors. That's what I've been going on about all talk. Because they run at low voltage. You know, they require semiconductor innovation, so we get lots of investment, either from industry or from, or from government, uh, either at the research level or, or at the commercialization level. And we have a modern, mature software ecosystem built on it. 50 years um, of uh, big companies like Intel and AMD and, and, and now NVIDIA, we've got very detailed, highly dense mathematical software to deal with what we need. Um, and you know, maybe some self-driving stuff in there as well. Um, the problem is, it's getting more and more expensive. Up to today, with these smaller and smaller process nodes, one of the other benefits is that it's actually cheaper per transistor. We're now getting to a point where the technology is so complex and so detailed that that trend may reverse. And it's putting people off designing bigger and bigger chips on the latest technology, which is where chiplets are going to come in. That's again, if you should talk. The second way is to actually stop using digital transistors at all. You know, there, there, are, there are plenty of other ways of doing compute, again, as we go through today. And these, you know, a lot of them take inspiration from nature or exploit nature. I mean, there's a reason we're not digital. And, and, and uh, maybe we can use that to great effect. And there are tremendous power gains. I mean, everybody, li everybody likes to quote the brain, the fact that the brain can do, you know, 10 to the 18 ops equivalent per second, and yet it's running at, a, you know, 5 to 20 watts. So the three seconds that you decided whether you wanted milk or orange in the fridge is more than some supercomputers today. And, and, and they're doing actually complex calculations. You're just looking in the fridge. Problem is, they're not as mature as the digital processes. Some of them are really old ideas, and that's great. But they haven't had the decades of billions or essentially trillions of dollars of investment to get there. So more efficient chips means computing less power, and we can save on cooling costs. Um, but the efficient chips sometimes have a scaling problem. They're not as dense, because again, not of all that research. So maybe you have to actually invest in physically larger data centers, which isn't always the case. And again, mature ecosystem. If we speak about neuromorphic, for example, the, the software is still getting off the ground there. And even, even in AI, the software is changing on a weekly basis, and it really infuriates me. Um, but but let's, get, let's go into a supercomputer, because um, I realize some people in the room may not understand that these are actually highly complex things with, with lots of chips. And this is typically how it's presented in the press. Big black box, data in, result out, go on your merry way. In fact, your fact, there's dozens of black boxes. <laughs> and, they're, and they're all connected um, in a variety of ways. They can either be connected like this in a simple 2D array, or maybe there are rings, topologies, and toruses, and, and on all sorts. Um, but inside each black box, if we delve in, on a broad, high level, they either contain compute and or storage. So the ability to actually do your computation or the ability to store data related to the computation, or both. In this instance, I'm going to cover the both because that's the standard model that most are using today. And in that box, so we have our compute and we have our storage. They're linked together. And we have some way of connecting to the outside world, which is what I've called networking. Now, that compute can be split up into different parts. Typically, we call these hosts and devices. Hosts are the standard CPUs, compute processing units, that most people are familiar with, uh, whereas accelerators are essentially optimized silicon that can do specific compute in lower power. So these are like your GPUs, your AI hardware. And then we have, it says DRAM, uh, so that's memory, so the ability to have uh, very fast memory. If you have your memory in a different system, your data in a different system, it takes time to get there. You lose power, you lose time, you lose efficiency. And then sometimes these accelerators also have their own dedicated memory on board. I put it in there, but I'll take it out for the future. Sometimes on the host side, the CPU side, we may be doing one, two, or up to eight. I think Microsoft has a 32 system. And the point of this diagram here is that with the storage accelerator and networking, these can be configured in different ways to optimize for either the workload, the installation, or the variety of users that we're doing it using it. Accelerators, you may not just have one. You may have uh, modern systems, modern supercomputers now, either use 2, 4, 6, 8, or in sometimes 16. And these can be uh, connected in a variety of ways with different fast connections. But 
I've put down here that maybe you know, networking is traditionally attached to the CPU, the host. Well, maybe you don't need to go back to that piece of silicon in order to speak to the outside world. Maybe you can do it straight from the accelerator. And there's lots of work uh, going into making that efficient, reducing latency, uh, redu you're increasing efficiency and all the benefits therein. And then storage as well. Is it, it, it can get, it's Lego bricks basically. <laughs> Build anything you like in any configuration you like, and as long as you've got the software stacks to support it, it works. Um, but this is a configuration that's uh, getting quite popular in modern supercomputers today. We have one host, we have six accelerators, we have some networking, and we actually have a lot of storage off-site, or just in, in a different black box. And the thing is, each of these segments have leaders, and leaders and standards that um, Again, each of these companies put billions of dollars into research because it is a multi-billion or trillion dollar business. A list of the companies here, I'm not going to go through them all or a list of technologies. Um, if you want to look into any of these, there's wealth of information on all of them. Um, and, I, and if you want, I could speak for an hour on each, at least. Um, but yeah, so going back to the traditional compute, the traditional digital compute that we're all very familiar with, why, why are we not using quantum, analog, neuromorphic, optical, reduce, or and that now we're using reduced precision, but all the other different sorts of compute. It's um, the reason why we're doing research into these is because could they be the next big thing? Can we actually get to a point where they will be faster or more efficient? Especially with, uh, some, say, some of the low power compute. Maybe the, it, it, turning on Alexa right now is a very, it, you know, audio waves, but then it's a very digital process and that consumes milliwatts to watts of power just to detect when you're saying Alexa. Maybe we can do that in microwatts. Multiply that by 10 million units and you're suddenly actually saving a good amount of energy on the grid. Um, so performance for what is actually getting more important than ever. I've got this slide again. It's, it's another list of companies for all the different areas that I've spoken about today. Um, most of which uh, I hope uh, everybody knows, some of which you may not, especially in the manufacturing material side. But in each element here, uh, each of these companies has either 10 to 100,000 employees and they're leveraging you know, anywhere from 10 to 10,000 partners, each with their own employee base and links to either industry or ac academia or, um, or a government. And just to cover a few of these companies very briefly uh, before we get to some Q&A, Intel is one of the biggest um, that, that I cover. Um, for full disclosure, Intel is one of my clients, so I am helping them in strategy and direction. Uh, so they're headquartered in the USA, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, market cap of the company, which as a metric isn't the best, but 126 billion. They do, they, they do a lot. They design the chips, they build the chips, and they work in... It, I describe Intel as six companies in a trench coat, like one of these big conglomerates like Samsung. And Intel is actually in 75% of supercomputers today. And in terms of their facilities, Mostly US focused, as you imagine, and I've mentioned the island um, fab, uh, that, that manufacturing facility uh, that's actually been expanded. One in Israel, se several um, in Asia, and uh, their, their whole thing is right now trying to move manufacturing away from Asia. We've got a strong reliance in Taiwan, and obviously the situation with Taiwan, depending on who you speak to, uh, can, can be quite tense. So if that all goes to pot, Intel is in the process of like a five to 10 year journey of bringing manufacturing back into either the US or Europe with investments. Um, they're making competitor in some of these spaces, especially in a, uh, AI as AMD. Again, another USA company uh, founded pretty much the same time. Uh, AMD is usually considered the underdog in the Intel AMD battle, but AMD today is actually worth more, almost 50% more. Um, they don't manufacture their own chips, they used to. They actually contract uh, TSMC to make a lot of their Silicon Design, uh, again, TSMC in Taiwan. And they're in 25% of supercomputers today. Now, the big elephant in the room uh, with regards to, uh, especially compute, is NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA has historically been in the computer graphics market, but they've actually been the biggest uh, winner in this whole AI space. Um, I made this slide two days ago. NVIDIA announced their financial report yesterday. That 759 billion market cap is now 1 trillion. <laughs> they went up 20% overnight uh, because they are printing money because everybody wants to speak about AI. And they have the most universal AI processor on the market. I'm, I'm pleased to say, actually, their software package is called CUDA. I actually attended the first CUDA course in the UK. 
uh, over in Oxford, and uh, that, was, that was something. That's 15 years ago. So they're the only company that has 15 years' worth of software expertise at the ground level. So the question I often get from um, some Wall Street investors is, will anyone dethrone these people in AI? It's going to be pretty tough. It's going to be pretty tough. Right now, they're only in 40% of supercomputers because they haven't necessarily focused on the host too much. They've got new products that focus on the host. Um, they're mostly focused on, on, on the GPU, the accelerators. Um, but in terms of AI, if you're familiar with AI terms, training and inference, they're actually in 90% of AI training um, today. Uh, and I wanted to highlight a supercomputer that's actually uh, just been announced in, in the UK, is Embard 3. It's a 10 million pound investment going to be built at Bristol. They're going to be using NVIDIA hardware. Um, it's a mixture of NVIDIA hardware and ARM IP. So, yep, yeah, let's stick another UK company in there. Uh, and it's going to be ready early 2024 using products that I think are being announced next week. Uh, but this system is going to be used for life sciences, medicine, energy. That, the standard, what a university supercomputer would be used for um, in traditional high performance compute. And if it's built today, in supercomputing, we have top lists the most performant supercomputers and the most energy efficient supercomputers in terms of uh, the, 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 its uh, gigaflops per watt. But how, how, what's your peak and how efficiently can you get there? This would be a, yeah, I've said 285, I actually did the numbers uh, this morning, 285 and 65 in terms of uh, where they would sit on those lists and it takes 270 kilowatts of energy. The biggest systems on the list take 30 megawatts. Um, and there are a number of systems in China that don't submit to these lists. So we don't know what they're doing so much. Uh, but if you wanted a system on the top 500 today, NVIDIA's latest product, you need about 80 of them. And they cost about 40 grand each. But that's essentially you know, end to end my talk based on where we are and to where we're here today. I um, want to highlight again this AI hardware show, because this is where a lot of my focus is these days. Um, you can find it on, on, on YouTube. You can just Google my name and you'll find it. We're 12 episode run, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>